Welcome to the Emerald City Hockey Podcast. Join RJ and Dylan as they discuss each week's Seattle Kraken news and top stories from around the league. So Dylan, what's the last hockey video game that you bought? Um, well, it's it's obviously an EA Sports video game since they've had the NHL license forever. It's either NHL 18 or 17, whichever one had Tarasenko on the cover. Uh, it looks like NHL 17. So it's All been right. a while. That is, actually, that is actually the same one. Uh, that's the last one I bought. I have not bought a hockey game uh, since NHL 17. And uh, I think EA Sports is probably the big reason for that. And of course, speaking of EA Sports, you know why I asked? Mm-hmm. Did you see those renderings EA Sports put out from the new NHL 22 game? Uh, the ones with the Kraken, they showed Mark Giordano in the Kraken jersey. Uh, this beautiful looking shot at Climate Pledge Arena. A lot of the renderings we've seen so far of the arena in action, you know, on game day, they've been kind of a more of drawing style, you know, meant to look more like a drawing than a simulation. And, you know, this one feels more real, doesn't it? So... Are you tempted at all to get NHL 22? The Kraken will be in it. (laughs) Not even a little bit. (laughs) I have to agree with you. Ah, man. EA Sports has just done me dirty too many times. I mean, let's put it this way. NHL 17 was my last one. The the, the one before that, I think, was NHL 13. And I I think the only reason we we both have NHL 17 was we were trying to do an online league with your brother. And I think that's the only reason we all bought it. We bought it on sale probably a year after it came out. <laughs> Just do it. Yes, we did. And but, we were trying to do a league with, with my brother, and we just played it. And it just the gameplay was so bad that we all voluntarily just went back to NHL 14. Yeah, it, was, it wasn't it was great. Um, as far as this year's, you know, it looks really good. This is the first time that they're bringing the NHL series over to the Frostbite engine, which is, of course, the... Uh, the game engine that's proprietary to EA. Uh, it was originally developed for their Battlefront series. Um, and, you know, it, it's it's definitely stylized, like you said, as far as the, the, the character modeling that you do in it. Um, I thought the arena shots look fantastic for NHL 22. Um, my only concern is we've seen the Frostbite engine at work for sports games in the FIFA series and in the Madden series. And... You know, it was an engine built originally for first-person shooters. It's It relies heavily on animations to work. Uh, its physics is not great. And, and we've seen that, you know, certainly in FIFA when it comes to physics can be really wonky. Just go on YouTube, you'll see some hilarious compilation videos about that. Madden-wise, we've seen the reliance, the over-reliance on animations really be a problem. Um, guys just kind of get sucked into tackles because the animation just triggers for whatever reason or you know a wide receiver will catch a ball through the db's hands because the animation just triggered for the wide receiver to catch it regardless of what's actually happening so i'm a little worried about that when it comes to uh, nhl 22 i could see the physics being pretty wonky as far as the puck i could see you know Goals are scored that, you know, normally wouldn't be scored, but just because the animation triggered that way for the goalie to be out of position or it's just, you know, the shot was just destined to go in by the by the ones and zeros within the software. So I'm, uh, I, I'm you know, I don't think the Kraken's inclusion is going to be enough to make me buy this. Right. One word that I would use to describe playing Madden with the Frostbite engine was scripted. Uh, it, it felt like there were certain things that whatever you did were just going to happen or not happen. Uh, and I'm interested to see how that would work out in a hockey video game. I, I'd be actually pretty interested to play it, but not enough to actually uh, plop down the money, especially given uh, EA's lack of innovation in this in this category in the past. I'm going to wait and see. Yeah, I mean, I will say a lot of like yours and mine's sticking points has been a lot of the like franchise mode stuff that they've really lagged behind on and whatnot i I will say the last couple nhl games they've they have felt smooth and i have thought that their physics engine what did work pretty good for a hockey game 
um, as far as like, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like if you're the defenseman, you slide over to like hip check an incoming forward. Like that felt good in these last couple NHL games. It was just, um, it almost felt too, I don't know. It almost felt like too smooth. Like, you know, when you watch like, like a super high resolution, you know, 60 frame per second video and it's just kind of like, it's so smooth. It feels off kind of. Like, that's almost how it felt sometimes skating around and puck handling. Like, it was just too, you could just turn on a dime too easily and keep all your momentum and all that kind of stuff. So it didn't, it didn't feel like hockey, but it felt, I guess it works as good as like an arcade type thing. Yeah, so we'll see as far as realism. One thing I'm curious about as far as accuracy, just a little tidbit. If you noticed in that rendering of Climate Pledge Arena, it's during a game, and it shows the Kraken presumably scoring their first home goal in franchise history against the Vancouver Canucks at the 2.03 mark of the first period. So we'll keep that in mind come October 23rd to see how close that is to reality. I know EA puts out their playoff simulations every year. They're usually very wrong, uh, but we'll see how close uh, they get to being correct on this one. I would love to see that. Yeah, that would be pretty great, actually. Uh, but as you mentioned also, one area that these EA games lack is kind of the management, the GM mode, something they really haven't put a lot of effort into for a long time. And that's something that we really enjoy. You know, we're kind of armchair GMs. We like building our projected Kraken roster as we did before the expansion draft. We love looking at the roster stuff. We love trades, free agent signings, all that sort of thing. And EA games just kind of fall short there, don't they? Yeah, they 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 really do. I mean, I guarantee you, if we were to hop into NHL 22, it's probably the franchise mode probably hasn't added anything since NHL 17. Yeah, probably. Uh, but since we're pointing out the negatives here, I think I should be positive about something. And if you are interested in that sort of you know, GM type aspect of it, maybe a little less interested in, you know, detailed gameplay or anything like that, but you want to make realistic trades and kind of feel like you're the GM of a team. I do have a game for listeners to recommend. Uh, it's called East Side Hockey Manager. It's available on Steam. Yes, uh, with updates, you can play as the Kraken. They don't sponsor us or anything. It's just a really good game. I feel like I need to talk about it because we've both spent countless hours enjoying the game, both separately and together, competing against each other. It is multiplayer. Uh, I would recommend that. Give it a try if uh, the GM kind of feel is more your thing. Yeah, it's it's really in depth. It's 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 a lot of fun. If if you're into that c kind of thing, you know, you're not going to be playing any actual games, right? It's all simulated, all the games, but. If, if you like drafting and scouting and trading and building out a roster, I mean, nothing beats it. So the other thing about NHL 22 that people had a lot of people talking was the cover athlete, Austin Matthews, for the second time in three years. And uh, we know there's the whole EA cover curse and whatnot. And uh, of course, Matthews being kind of a repeat guy, there was some backlash there. But it made me think of this question for you, Dylan. Who will be the first Kraken player on the cover of an EA NHL game? Because now they have their own set of players that are all eligible. We've got some, you know, no huge names, but uh, some guys that could definitely be good players. Who do you think will be the first Kraken to make it onto the cover? Um, you know, I'm assuming it's not going to happen in the next year or two. So I'm going to go ahead and go with uh, Matty Beniers, right? I mean... That's a good pick. He's uh, he's the highest pick in franchise history, highest selected pick. Uh, he, uh, <laughs> you know, he's just he's so good. He's gonna be a fan favorite. We all know it. He's gonna be the first line center there. You know, probably two years from now, and I think he's gonna drive this team. And and I think the team's gonna be pretty good by then. You know, uh, I just I just think he's gonna be the face of the franchise. So I, I think it's him. If I had to pick an alternate, Vince Dunn. I, I'll, I'd roll the dice on that. Huh. Just, you yeah, think so? Yeah, you know, maybe he gets the, the extra playing time. He, he has, you know, some some crazy good season one year where he scores like 20 goals and 65 points or something, and they just give it to him, you know. 
I, I don't think he'll consistently do that, but I could see, you know, we've all seen guys go off on one, in one year. Interesting. Uh, I would not have thought Vincent, probably Grubauer would have been my, uh, my pick if he has another Vesna caliber season of someone off the current roster. Uh, but I got to agree overall. I think it's been years. He probably has the most kind of superstar marketability, you know, potential of, of anyone that the, the Kraken have right now. Now, speaking of Beniers, we did get some big news about his future on Friday. So as expected, Beniers will be returning to the University of Michigan this season to play out his sophomore year there. He'll uh, join other high draft picks. You got Owen Power, Luke Hughes, Kent Johnson. I mean, that Michigan team is simply going to be stacked. And it's got to be probably the favorite to be NCAA champions this year. So this isn't really a surprise. You know, when we kind of listened to Beniers and Ron Francis around the draft, they did seem to be a little bit leaning toward Beniers going back, especially given the lack of a full season in college last year. They both mentioned that. So Dylan, is this ultimately what's best for Beniers, his development and his future with the Kraken? Probably. Uh, I just think, you know, it's never a bad thing for any young player, any high draft pick to go back uh, to wherever they were playing and develop another year. Uh, certainly physically, they always need to develop physically. Um, I don't care, you know, who the prospect is, even an Owen Power, right? He needs to fill out that 6-4 frame before, you know, I would want to see him tossed into an, an, you know, regular NHL minutes. I think for Beniers, the style of play that he has, I think another year of getting stronger, building muscle, all that stuff. I mean, you know, anybody listen to this, think back to when you were 18, right? The difference between 18, 20, and then 22, just in your physical development is huge. So um, I, I don't have a problem with him going back. I think it's the right move. Um, he's going to go back. He's going to win a lot of games at Michigan. Because as you said, I mean, they got four of the top five picks from this year's draft playing on that team together. And, um, you know, it's another year for him to show that he's he's a number one center. If he can, you know, do that at Michigan, which I think he will, um, you know, he can lead that group. I think that's going to be a big deal leadership, too. I, I just think all that stuff's going to be good. And, you know, it would be really hard to throw an 18 year old into this lineup that, you know, everyone's all trying to figure stuff out. They're all trying to build chemistry together you know, first year for an expansion club. Nobody's played together before. I just think it's probably uh, not the best environment for an 18-year-old. Yeah, you're dealing with kind of two opposite ends of the spectrum as far as chaos versus structure. And just the the inherent chaos you're going to have on an expansion team, like you said, uh, versus the structure of that Michigan team with so much talent coming back. He's going to be playing with a lot of NHL-level talent and like you said, they're going to win a lot of games. And it'll be fun to watch him, too. It's definitely something we're going to keep an eye on over the course of this season, how Michigan's doing. I think a lot of the hockey world is just going to keep an eye on that because it's been a long time since we've seen a college team as stacked as they are. Uh, and that'll be exciting to watch. So from a scout's perspective, Dylan, I'm curious. You did your kind of pre-draft scouting report on Matty Beniers. You got a really good look at him. What is an area of his game that you want to see him work on this year at Michigan? Yeah, it, it's it's his shot. It's his scoring. Um, and, you know, he said that at the draft, too, after he was selected by the crack. And he wants to go back. He wants to work on his offensive game. If you've watched even five minutes of tape on Matty Beniers, you know his two-way game is strong. He's he's super reliable defensively. He forechecks harder than anybody else. He's got that high motor. But, you know, offensively, he can set guys up, but his shot is not NHL caliber yet. Certainly not for a top two-line centerman. So um, I want to see him work on his shot. I think he plans on doing that based on all the interviews and stuff I've seen with him. Um, he knows that that's his weakness right now, and, and there's no reason to think that it won't get a lot better this year. Yeah. So, the Veneers announcement wasn't the only Kraken news that we had on Friday. There was also a minor free agent signing. Uh, the Kraken signed 27-year-old goalie Antoine Bebo to a one-year, two-way deal. Uh, Bebo is now the fourth goalie the Kraken have under contract, and I think barring some major injury trouble in that he'll probably spend all of next season playing for the Kraken's AHL affiliate in Charlotte. Any thoughts on the Bebo signing, Dylan? No, just that they're filling out, you know, the organizational depth chart thing, right? Uh, 
He'll definitely be behind Joey Decor in uh, Charlotte. So, you know, yeah, he's he's definitely fourth in line to see anything in Seattle, which very rarely some, something really disastrous would have to go wrong for him to come into play for the Kraken. But, you know, it's they're filling out filling out the roster. That's what we're excited to see. Right. It, again, it's, you know, a month ago we didn't have a roster. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yep. <laughs> yeah. If the signing happened, uh, you know month and a half ago we're all we're all talking about it like oh my goodness wow we have a goalie yeah. <laughs> so good to keep that in perspective mm -hmm. um, but moving on uh, I want to talk about something we covered in our last video on our YouTube channel and that is Jersey ads that's probably been the biggest NHL news of the past couple weeks uh, we did a video basically asking the question what should the Kraken's Jersey ad be given that it's it's coming. It's going to be inevitable. And we kind of looked at some potential options for them, complete with mock-ups to see what the jerseys would look like. If you haven't seen that video, you can go check it out on our YouTube channel to kind of see our take on what the Kraken's jersey sponsor should be. But I want to talk about jersey ads in general. It's a controversial decision by the league, to say the least. Jerseys have long been viewed as kind of a sacred space where, you know, even as the ice, the boards, the helmets, they've all been filled with ads. The jerseys were left pristine and untouched. And of course, with jersey ads on the way for the 2022-23 season, all that's going to end. Uh, and of course, to make a decision with that big a downside, the upside has to be pretty significant. And of course it is. Each ad will probably go for upwards of $6 million you know, times 32 teams. That's a lot of hockey-related revenue for a league that's in desperate need of it post-COVID. So Dylan, I am curious... Really curious to hear your take on this because sometimes I need to be reminded that hockey is a business. And when that is the case, you are always the one to remind me of that. So what do you think about Jersey ads coming to the NHL? Am I, am I too disappointed about it? Help me get my priorities in order, Dylan. I know you see your smile. I, I know you're eager to do that. Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it, it was an inevitable thing. Right. I think we all kind of saw the writing on the wall. I think COVID sped this up uh, significantly. Um, you know, I mean, in like the span of 18 months, Gary Bettman went from like over my dead body to, hey, they're here. Uh, but, you know, it's not the end of the world. Like, like they're there, but they're they're you know, they're small. As we as we found when we were looking at the mock ups you made last week, a lot of them, you know, they don't really they don't really steal your eye from the crest. We're not going to end up with like you know, European style jerseys where there's so many ads and everything you can't even like figure out where the player's name is, right? Like like it's not it's not going to turn into NASCAR overnight. Um, that being said, you know I am a NASCAR fan, so maybe that's why it doesn't bother me uh, as much. <laughs> but um, you know this is kind of what I was talking about last week or the last couple weeks, right? When it comes to the salary cap rising how I didn't believe it was going to stay a flat cap for three to five years. The NHL, all, all sports leagues, right? They're all businesses. They're all run as businesses. Each team runs them as a business. They are an entertainment business. Um, but, you know, all, le all sports leagues are really good at finding money when they need it, and the NHL especially is, usually because they're the most desperate for it. But, you know, this is just another example of that. And, uh, you know... Yeah, it, it does suck. Like, I would have preferred that they're not there. But at the same time, like, a couple of weeks in, I'm probably not even going to really notice, right? Like, at the end of the day, I'm going to be watching the game, right? I'm not going to just be staring at jerseys and going, like, ah, I hate that that AWS logo is there. You know what I mean? Like, I just, I, I think I'm going to be too wrapped up in what's actually happening to, to notice. I don't know. I think... I think I'm going to see him. I, I think I am going to notice it. I I really enjoy kind of the way that the game looks. That's something that's always um, drawn me to it. Just the the distinct colors on the on the jerseys, the uniforms. That's kind of drawn me to the game since I was a kid. And it's it is going to bug me. I, I know it is. It's just going to I mean, we'll see how well the colors blend. We looked at a few different options. Some were definitely better than others. Um, but I know that for some teams, it's going to be something that kind of stands out that looks like an eyesore. Um, but I understand the business argument of it. You know, it's going to bring in a lot of money. They need the hockey-related revenue. 
I do still worry about the slippery slope argument. And I know you said we're not going to be turning into NASCAR, you know, anytime soon. But one thing I remember when we were talking about helmet ads like a year ago is, you know, this is just on the helmets. It's a temporary thing. So the league can get some much needed revenue. It's not going to expand to jerseys. We're not there at all. Just calm down. It's just the helmets. And then less than a year later, we have the jersey ad announcement. So, I, Frank, I just don't believe it. I think we might see a second jersey ad. I think we might see ads on the pants. I think we might start to get that sort of thing because if the revenue's there, this seems like kind of the big, um, the big, uh, you know, bridge that that they need to be hesitant to cross. This once they've crossed this, I don't, I don't see any hesitation. Like, oh, we've already got ads on the uniform. Um, so I just, I, I do worry about that. Yeah, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's, it was like the last unsullied, you know, place. But at the same time, you know, I don't know. We've got, we've got ads on the boards. We've got ads on the ice. You could argue just the fact that the, the, the brand that makes the jersey, right? You know, regardless of who it's been throughout the years, Reebok, Adidas now, that's on the jersey pretty prominently right i mean what is that if not an ad for who's making the jersey or on the pants right like they're, they're already there so yeah i i don't like that argument because you see that's just something that's inherent with with clothing any kind of uniform you know like that where you have the the makers you know put their brand on it that's just something you see i mean yes i guess it functions dually as an ad but it's that's just something you see on all clothes. It's different. It's not something that's completely unrelated to it. I, yeah, I mean, I, I just, it's it's something there that is not from the team, and it's something there that draws the eye, you know, potentially away from, you know, the the crest or the, the you know, I don't know, the NHL logo, if you're actually looking for that. I don't know that many people do. Um, it's just, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. It does feel like this, you know, crossing the Rubicon moment where it's just like, we've, we've, we've done this now. There is no, there's nothing, you know, no lands left to conquer, but it's, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know that it's going to expand that much further. I, I don't, I, I think a lot of the moves were done specifically because of COVID. You know, I'm not saying that once COVID's over and revenue goes back up naturally that they're going to, you know, go back to not having ads. Obviously they are here for, the foreseeable future um but at the same time like i don't know I, this was such a big deal for them and i'd be really curious to know internally at the nhl how this happened because i right. have to imagine there was some very stiff opposition and at the end of the day the money argument was the only reason that they got this through so um i i think the powers that be are going to keep it from you know spiraling further than this Hopefully, um, although this is, like I said, this is kind of the area where I would think if they don't stop it now. But um, I, I understand the money argument, and ultimately that that always wins out, as you like to remind me. Um, but that's the reason that with these sort of things, also you never see it going backwards. Like we're, we're never mm -hmm. getting rid of it. There will never yeah. not be jersey ads again. It just doesn't go in that direction. Uh, so we'll see how much further it goes. What, one thing I'll be interested in is, um, you know, are these going to be on like stadium series jerseys and mm. heritage jerseys when they do that kind of stuff? Because I got to think, you know, those are the big nationally televised games. Those get all the all the revenue and all the TV stuff. I got to think that those, you know, are those going to be separate deals for the teams involved where they can charge a little <laughs> bit more for those? Um, something you brought up last week when we were talking was what do you do when you're in the Stanley Cup finals? Where does that finals crest go? That's always on yep. the jersey, that patch. Like, that's something that's got to be figured out now. Are you just going to have, like, that go under the ad or over the ad so you got two things on one side? Like, that would look terrible. That would look terrible. I think you can agree with me there. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, uh, you know, that'll be, again, because, you know, at the end of the day, if if you're buying ad space, you want it to be seen as much as possible so you want it there in the stanley cup finals because that's when most people are watching right so uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that stuff plays out whether or not they shift that to the shoulder 
the add to the shoulder and then they they stick the stanley cup final uh patch on the front or if they put the stanley cup final pa- patch on the shoulder that i mean i guess that could happen but i think that would look pretty bad but yeah i mean it's it's just one of those things i just feel like every time you walk into an arena you're already assaulted by ads literally everywhere right <laughs> like literally every everywhere there is space to put an ad on something in an arena it is there an ad is there the jumbotron's filled with like three of them at any given time you know the ice is littered with them the boards are completely packed with them you know you see them on the freaking stairs for crying out loud right on the lower bowl where they're going to be seen on tv so on the bench behind them or in the penalty box like like ads are just everywhere and they're just a part of the game and i feel like you know for the most part i just block them all out at this point because i'm just watching the game so that's why i feel like i might you know a couple weeks in i might just do that with these yeah, I, I am hoping that that's the case. I'm hoping that the jersey ads kind of disappear as much as the ones on the ice, on the boards. Um, even though they've taken some measures to combat that, like the ads on the glass, behind the projected ads on the glass <laughs> behind the goalie uh, for the TV broadcast, which I am, I am not a fan of. Uh, but yeah, hopefully they'll kind of just disappear to the eye. Uh, one more thing I did think of, though, when we were talking about this cup final patch. I remember when the Detroit Red Wings were in the cup finals in, uh, I think it was 08 and 09. The Red Wings are are unique as a team because they have their captain and alternate captain letters on the opposite side of the jersey that most teams do. They're on the right side, I believe. Yeah, Mm -hmm. the right side. And of course, that's where the cup final patch would go. And what they did, I just looked this up, is they put the letter next to the cup final patch and i think it does not look very good at all oh my gosh uh, that sounds terrible oh seven you said uh oh eight i yeah i'm looking at a uh oh eight oh nine uh chris draper game worn jersey uh i just i searched red wings cup final patch and found it but yeah it uh does not look good so i'm hoping we don't see a situation like that with oh, that's terrible. The Jersey ads. Do you see it? Yeah, that's terrible. I like looking I, at the pictures of them like hoisting the cup and stuff, and it's just so it's so loaded to one side. There's definitely mm-hmm. no symmetry there. So that's, I guess, the the type of thing I'm hoping to avoid. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think we can agree on that. There, there's probably a better way to get around that. Yeah, my guess is they're gonna figure something out by by the time that gets here. Although you know, it's the NHL. You never know. Maybe they That's haven't true. even thought of it yet. <laughs> I know. They'll yeah, figure we... it out during the conference finals. They're going to go, oh, wait a second. Yep. I maybe, can see that. Maybe they'll design them to, you know, have the ad in the patch. That's, hmm. that'll, that'll be that, great, oh, right? Boy, that would be. I mean, don't they have, uh, for the Memorial Cup, it's like the MasterCard Memorial Cup and the MasterCard logo is part of the patch. Maybe they'll do yeah, something like that. Yeah, because it's. Because it says, you know, it's the MasterCard Memorial Cup is literally on yep. the patch because they, they sponsor the whole thing. And so, you know, it's the normal, like, MasterCard logo where the two, like, colored circles are in there, right. in the word. But it's, you know, it's pretty small. Like, like it's there, but it's not the first thing you notice when you look at those patches. At least not for me. No, no. I mean, if I was a ad- Jersey advertiser, I'd almost want it bigger than that. I would want something that was uh, more prominent. Um. But I did want to talk about a couple more options for the Kraken's jersey ad. Now, we discussed a few options on the YouTube video, but we had some good suggestions in the comments, uh, ones that I think you know might uh, be possible. And the first one is Alaska Airlines. Yeah. Where the color scheme would match really well. They're already a major sponsor. They've got ads on the ice at the, at the practice facility. They're already teamed up with the crack and that might be one that i i would like seeing just because it's not going to draw the eye and the colors are going to work yeah i was just going to say that would look pretty seamless on on a jersey on a kraken jersey um it would not it would not draw your eye away from the main team crest at all i think uh and and yeah it's you know it's very it feels local, even though it's not like totally local, but it, it still feels right. like something. If you don't live in the Pacific Northwest, you don't know what Alaska Airlines is, basically, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't have a problem with that one, actually. I think that's a good one. Yeah, I'd be okay with it, too. And 
as far as sponsors go, that one's that one's pretty tame to, you know, Amazon and Starbucks kind of come with their own baggage mm-hmm. a little bit uh, versus Alaska Airlines. You know, airlines already always have the, you know, some horror stories, but I, you know, I, I think they're fine. I've flown Alaska plenty of times. It's always been a good experience. Yeah. Um, so I'd be okay with that one. You're and good. then one more ad suggestion uh, was Nintendo. And I think that would that would just be awesome. That would look really cool. There's no chance of it happening, uh, but I would like to see it. Yeah, I mean, the the red from the Nintendo jersey, you know, logo would look good with the kind of red um, piping that they mm-hmm. have on the jersey already. But yeah, I don't I don't think that's going to happen either, unfortunately. Yeah. So uh, another bit of NHL news recently, and this is kind of a crazy one, but seems like we're almost used to that from this market at this point. Uh, the Coyotes, uh, the arena in Glendale, uh, ending their <laughs> lease agreement with the Coyotes. The Coyotes will have to have somewhere else to play. They got evicted, uh, RJ. They got evicted, RJ. Just say it how it is. All right, I was I was trying to trying to be kind here, but yes, they they got evicted from their arena. Um, even with, yeah, the, it's, it's uh, not a good situation for them at the moment. No, I mean, it's it's kind of wild. And, you know, the NHL hasn't said anything. We don't know what's going to happen. We know the Coyotes are still going to play there this year. But we don't know about what happens after that, whether or not they'll either work out a deal, they'll, um, you know, move more into Phoenix proper, or if they're going to move to, you know, Quebec City or Hamilton or God knows where. Um, we just don't really know any of that stuff. Um, so it would all be speculative if we were to touch on it. But I mean, RJ, it was only like, what, four or five years ago that like fans were able to taser the Glendale city head of the city council or whatever. Remember that whole <laughs> thing? Yeah, all that, uh, all that for, for this ending. I mean, I... Went to Phoenix a couple times uh, when I was looking at law schools, which that never happened. But anyway, I got to talk to some of the people who were involved in that decision, including a you know a prominent judge briefly. And it was interesting to talk to him about it. And it seemed like he kind of had the idea that from the beginning, this was not going to work out in Glendale. And if you go to that area and just drive from like the city center where most of the people are out to Glendale, You'll see why that wasn't going to work. It's just too much of a hassle for fans to get all the way out there. I mean, this the Suns Arena, that works really well because it's you know right in the city or where the Diamondbacks play. It's right in the city. It's easy to get to versus it's like a 20-minute drive out to Glendale if you want to see a Coyotes game. And I think there's definitely the chance for things to work out well for the Coyotes if they just get an arena that's in the right location. Mm-hmm. Um I was not surprised by the low attendance figures at all, given where that arena is. Uh, So I think this might actually be a good thing for them long term if they stay in that market. Uh, Obviously, there's uh, no guarantee of that. Yeah, it's and I mean, it would be better for the NHL, too, right? Like they've been a, a pretty heavy financial burden on the NHL as a whole for a long time now. I mean, the NHL owned the team for a little while. It was so disastrous so yeah it's one of those you just you just want it to be in a position where the franchise can be successful like like yep. yeah like it's it's fun and easy to joke about it but it's also kind of reaching that point where it's just sad yeah like legitimately for sure. sad. The fans. they deserve better yeah um, players deserve better it's just something they shouldn't have to deal with but you said it's fun to joke about but it's also fun to speculate if the team were to move, where would you want to see them go? Um, we're not talking about Seattle anymore, is it? Destiny? We already got the team, so that's <laughs> true. Yeah, I mean, there's no, there's no kind of spot um, on the West Coast anymore. Seattle was the obvious one, so um, I guess you could keep without um, having to totally realign the divisions. You can move them to Houston. I, I know that that's one of the potential things that's been talked about. Um, Houston's the biggest city in the U S to not already have an NHL team. So it kind of fits that way. Um, I think I saw something there, like the fifth largest city in the, in the country, which kind of surprised me. 
but at the same time, I mean, I don't know. I, They're growing, I think. Yeah, <laughs> so. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think Houston would work because you just don't have to deal with any sort of divisional realignment. Um, otherwise, I mean, Quebec, they have the arena. They have the desire for a team. Maybe not this team, but, you know, they. I'm sure they'd take it. Uh, Hamilton's always been thrown around forever. Hamilton, Ontario. Um, maybe you wouldn't have to realign the divisions because they're kind of playing in the central. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it could it could work, um, but yeah, I mean, I don't, I really don't know. Like I said, I don't entirely know that the NHL doesn't want to still try to make it work in Arizona somewhere. Oh, I'm sure they do. I, that's always been Bettman's top priority with that situation, and I'm sure he'll do whatever he can. But as we saw with you know the Thrashers, sometimes. You just can't make it work. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we'll see. By the way, I just checked Houston is the fourth largest city in the U.S. by population. So oh, there we go. So we it's, go. It's, Phoenix know. is the fifth, by the way. Phoenix is the fifth. Okay. All right. So well, an upgrade there, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. So lastly, uh, I want to talk about the NHL draft, specifically three NHL drafts. 2010... 2013 and 2015 now dylan do you know what very important thing those three nhl drafts have in common um i was gonna for a moment say you know they had the oilers picking first overall but that is not true because in 2013 it was not the oilers uh it's the fact that i was at all those drafts that is true i'm I'm assuming (laughs) yep no that's that's what i had in mind no, no, no special fact, you know, better than that. <laughs> Dylan, you were at all those drafts. Uh, mm-hmm. I was at two of them. I was at 2010 and 2015 with you. I did not go to 2013. Uh, missed out on some fun, fun stories and fun memories there. Yeah, the, um, the but, Nathan McKinnon bus crash story is a good one. <laughs> yeah, we gotta, we gotta have you tell that at some point later on the podcast. Uh, that's, yeah. that's, that is an all timer. Um, so. If you've never been to an NHL draft, by the way, if you're listening, I highly recommend it. Mm-hmm. Everyone in the hockey world all converges on the same place. You never know who you're going to run into, what you'll see. Um, you know, I ran into Peter DeBoer in an elevator. Like that, it just has, stuff like that happens. Um, you know, that's like story one of 50 for the day. You know, there's always something. Uh, Dylan was in a bus crash with Nathan McKinnon. It, mm-hmm. Cool stuff happens. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I so, mean, it's, it's it's one of those things. Hockey is still the last of the leagues where it's you know it's it's very much a network of friends kind of feeling, right? Like everyone knows each other, and it's very relaxed. And you know, the drafts are always held at an arena. I guess this last year that wasn't the case, but usually they're always held at an arena. And you know, you'll just run into like GMs of the teams and stuff just out on the concourse, hanging out, getting food. Like, they just get food from the concession stands like anybody else. Like, all these top people, all the top prospects are just there walking around, you know, so you can you can run into them, you can take pictures, that kind of stuff. So it's it's definitely a special thing. And I think, you know, I'm sure Seattle will host one in the not-too-distant future, just being a newer city to the league. Absolutely. I, I could definitely see that happening pretty soon. Uh, and if so, if you have a chance to go, go. Mm-hmm. Um but talking about these three drafts, it's been a long time now. It's six years since the 2015 draft. It's uh, 11 years since the 2010 draft. We've had enough time for to have some hindsight, to have some of these players develop and really kind of see how the draft class shapes up. And I thought it might be fun to compare them a little bit. And uh, I guess we'll start with, Dylan, which draft class of the three has the best top five? Top five picks. What do you think? Um, I mean, Connor McDavid kind of carries it for 2015, right? Like, just Don't him. Forget Jack Eichel. I was gonna say Eichel being in there. You know, Mitch Marner. Say what you want about him. The guy puts up points, right? Um, yeah. Just, I, for for the listeners, we we'll go. It was McDavid one, Eichel two, Dylan Strom three, Mitch Marner four, and Noah Hannafin five. Yeah. So you know, Strom and Hannafin, you know. They maybe drag it down a little bit. That being said, Noah Hannafin still played a ton of games. I mean, he's played more games than anybody in that top five. Um, I'd give that one the edge over 
probably either of the other two. What about you? Uh, I would make an argument for 2013, actually. You've got Nathan McKinnon at one, uh, Alexander Barkov at two, mm -hmm. uh, Jonathan Drouin at three, Seth Jones four, and Elias Lindholm at five. Um, now, you got McDavid Eichel, and you've got McKinnon Barkov. I mean, w what a pair <laughs> of centers for both of those. And I think, given Barkov, I don't know, I think that might even out, really. It might even be slightly better if you, if, you know, on the depth perspective, um, depending on how you feel about Barkov versus Eichel. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say right now, just Barkov's two-way ability probably, you know, elevates him. It helps with the point discrepancies. But, but even that, I mean, the points aren't that far off from each other. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess certainly, you know, Seth Jones, I think we can say is better than Noah Hannafin as far as the defensemen yep. in these in these groups go. Um, Lindholm's always been solid wherever he's been playing. Uh, you know, not spectacular, but definitely solid. Drew Ann's really the kind of, you know, the letdown here. And we, we all know how that situation's developed over the yeah. years. But if you look at his career still, he's got 232 points, 393 games, yeah. not bad scoring numbers, and you know who knows what the rest of his career uh, will hold. But I think that's right up there with it. I don't think it's an easy uh, easy pick there. Probably better than 2010, though. You got Hall and Sagan, both very good. Eric Goodbranson, Ryan Johansson, and Nino Niederreiter. I think that does fall into third place here, right? Yeah, you know, with looking at the 2010 draft, looking back at it now... It's really interesting because it, it felt like for a long time it was like, wow, we saw all these, you know, great players drafted. And I don't know if it's just because it's it's been so much longer ago than the other two. The other two have more recency bias, but it feels like a lot of the guys on this 2010 thing, it's like we, we've we seen them around long enough now to see them become bad. Yep. Ryan, Ryan Johansson kind of being the poster child for that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that can happen after eleven years. You have certain guys that, you know, are, are now past their past their prime. Um, you know, we're seeing that even uh, as good as maybe Kuznetsov and Tarasenko, you know, later in that class have been. You know, they're they're not as good as they once were. So I think that's just something that that you start to see after uh, eleven years. Yeah, I mean, so so that was the top five. Which which class do you think was deepest as a whole? deepest as a whole i i've still got to say i think 2015 is just a legendary draft class i mean you when you have someone like you know matt barzell you know picked in the in the first you still you have anthony sorelli in the third um connor garland in the fifth uh i mean it's it has a really deep first round um, but then also deeper to the draft, you still get uh, a lot of quality players. Kirill Kaprizov in the fifth. Yes. Um, I mean, I know, you know it's... Mason, Mason Appleton in the sixth. And I don't think we've even seen, you know, the start of what he's capable of. Yeah. I mean, there's actually quite a few Kraken uh, players on all of these lists. Vince Dunn was also 2015. Yep. Uh, Jaden Schwartz, of course, first round pick of the Blues in 20, uh, 2010. Uh, but yeah, 20, 2015, you just look at like the top 10, it's like, stop me when, you know, if you sort it by points, it's like, stop me when I get to a bad player, McDavid, Marner, Eichel, Sebastian Ajo, Miko Rantanen, Matthew Barzell, Kyle Connor, Travis Konechny, Brock Boser, Zach Werwenski, right? Like, it's insane the amount of guys that came out of this draft. For sure. And the thing is also with the goalies, I think you have a lot of goalies that you're only starting to see what their potential is, uh, just given that it's only six years ago and goalies take longer to develop. Um, Ilya Samsonov, still very young. Mm -hmm. um, you got Joey Decord, who I think, another Kraken, uh, who I think you're still just starting to see the potential there. Um, Aiden Hill, looks like he'll get his first real starting job with the Sharks this year. Um, yeah, and then you've got some others too uh, coming up. So I think 2015 is probably the deepest and the deepest that the NHL has seen in a while. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And, and it, you know, it, it felt like that at the time too. Like, and mm -hmm. you know, a lot of that was the McDavid Eichel stuff, right? Like everyone was, was huge on that. It was even bigger back than, than Taylor Tyler, which, you know, we remember from 2010. Um, 
but yeah, like it was just one of those you just knew watching it, watching, you know, pick after pick come off the board, you were just seeing, you know, future all stars go. And that was that was really exciting to be there for that. Um, now, how do you how do you view this year's draft class compared to some of these? Like it doesn't have that like number one, you know, showstopper guy the way a, a Taylor Hall or certainly a McDavid or McKinnon might be. But I got to say, I watched, you know, a lot of tape looking at who the Kraken might might take. And I, and I feel like, you know, the top nine guys taken this year, they're pretty good. Yeah, I think it's uh, a kind of depth in the top 10 that that might rival, you know, any number of, of draft classes that you could get. Uh, and, and of course, the thing with this is a lot of players didn't have a full season to watch mm -hmm. i think it's going to look like there's crazy amounts of depth when we're talking you know six years eight years in the future because i think you're going to see a lot of guys in the second third fourth round uh have careers that are more like first round picks uh just given the nature of the draft yeah uh the other thing that strikes me is you know a lot of those other drafts we're we're talking and it's like you know there's one or two defensemen maybe that really stand out as like legit top, you know, defensemen. But I feel like this past year you had Owen Power, you had Simon Edvinson who I've been high on all along. You have Brant Clark. Like I could see all of those guys being legit top pairing guys, you know, and future all stars. Um, just on on top of everything. Yes, I know Luke Hughes is in there, taken fourth overall. I do not like Luke Hughes. I haven't liked his tape. If you've watched any of our draft videos, you know that. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I also think the, the European talent this year was, was kind of special too. Uh, you know, Edmondson, like I said, William Eklund, I think is going to be really, really good. Uh, just for Wallstead is just like the best goalie prospect I've ever seen in a draft year. So, um, it'll be interesting to see how things shake out. And of course, Matty Beniers, right? I mean, yep. we're, we're going to be looking back at this five eight, ten years from now and go crack and nailed it, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to... And the, the Sabres are going to be looking back and think, darn, we should have picked Matty Beneers. Mm -hmm. I got to go with that other Michigan kid. Not the other other Michigan kid or the other 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 Michigan kid, but the <laughs> other Michigan kid. Uh, exactly. So that's all for this episode of the Emerald City Hockey Podcast. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Next week's episode, we are going to be doing a mailbag episode. So reach out to us on any of our social media. I will tweet something. You can comment on that for questions that you might have. Leave a comment on this video. Uh, reach out to us, any of our social media. If you have any questions about the Kraken, the NHL, anything really, Ask us and uh, we'll answer it on next week's podcast. So we'll see you then, everyone.